that we'd do a raid on Goose Green by two para. A raid, not to take the place, but to duff it up and, and make life difficult for them. This had two aims. One, to stop them coming and making our life difficult, because they're only about 20 miles away, or less. And secondly, to give them the idea that we might actually be thinking of going along the southern route, via Goose Green and then along the track there through Fitzroy, uh, which again was a bit of a bluff. And then this became a complete distraction from the real mission, which was going on to, to Mount Kent. So I cancelled it. I was then summoned to the SATCOM, which had just been established in Ajax Bay by, by Admiral Fieldhouse, and said, what's the problem? So I said, well, we're trying to get onto Mount Kent. We we're trying to get our chaps forward onto Mount Kent. And eventually he said, everyone's getting very impatient. Go and take Goose Green. I said, you mean capture it? He said, yes. I understand he had this idea put into his head by someone else. And he was understandably quite worried about the fact they were losing a lot of ships and there wasn't any sort of visible progress being made. I assured him we weren't just hanging around doing nothing. So we now switch our attention to Goose Green, or a lot of our attention to Goose Green. Uh, and I send H. Jones and two para down to Goose Green. I say to him, the raid you're going to do is off. I told him that some days before. You're now going to capture it. And he said, do you mean capture? I said, yes. I didn't want to do it. My, my intelligence staff had described it quite correctly as a, as a self-administering POW camp. You know, they'd lock themselves in there. It was um, dreamt up, if you can call it that, by the army staff at Northwood. So the war was being run by Admiral Fieldhouse in, in Northwood. It was a Navy headquarters back then. But he had an army team who'd come from Wilton to reinforce him. And General Trant came and visited from Wilton and spoke to Admiral Fieldhouse. Uh, and Admiral Fieldhouse said, we're in my words, we're in a bit of a spot of bother here um, because, you know, the Navy are losing a lot of ships we're taking, and we can't sustain these losses. Um, and the land force hasn't broken out yet. And if it continues like this, we may have to withdraw the, the landing force. And that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a very, very significant statement. So General Trant went into a planning room with the army staff and said, right, we need to, we need to help Admiral Fieldhouse here. What are we going to do? You know, we're the land experts. And out of that room came the idea of Goose Green. We need a victory. We went to a, a start line and um, you know, the forward company started moving off. There was tracer going through you know, the sky and it seems strange, you, you can't necessarily hear it, but you can see you know, the odd tracer and you know that you know, every, between every one of those there's, there's four bullets. Uh, things seemed to stop, I remember it was raining really heavily and um, we were trudging down the um, trudging down the centre line and the guys lay in the mud either side. We found out that, you know, the, the front companies have got bogged down a bit, uh, taking some positions, so so the rest of the battalion was basically just stopped. And um, we found the main headquarters. I was just listening to all the radio traffic. Um, and um, uh, Colonel Jones was on the radio. He was clearly frustrated, to say mildly. He was shouting, shouting and screaming, you know, I want mortars, get me mortars, there are people dying up here. And um, I never heard him on the radio after that. Um, not long after that, uh, I had his radio operator come on the, on the radio and he said, you know, sun rays down. He fought and died in the manner in which he lived. You know, those who knew him well, when they heard what had happened, were not remotely surprised that he would have done what he did. The battle was not going very well, you know. On reflection, um, two power had been badly under-resourced for the battle. They weren't given the artillery they needed. 
they um, they didn't have enough mortars with them because they couldn't carry the mortar bombs. You know, so they were it was a proper gutter fight, and they were the daylight had come. They were taking casualties, and uh, they didn't have momentum. Any really good commander, you hope they would have done the same as my father did. I hope that I'd have had the courage to do the same as as he would. And then I felt, my God, you know, I sent him there, and I, he's died. I under-resourced them. It was entirely my fault. H. Jones asked to have light armour, and I said, you can't have it. I don't want it bogged down on the way there. I should have taken another commando and gone myself and, and made a big operation out of it, in which case we would have got through much quicker. Then we, we got forward onto the ridge, and we could see the machine guns in, like, bunkers on the other forward slope of the next hill. And um, they were out range of, the, of what we got. So we, they had us well pinned down. But um, Chris Keeble had been the, um, the OC of the anti-tank div at the School of Infantry before he became the settling command. And he got a couple of guys from the anti-tanks to fire missiles at these bunkers, uh, which, which they hit straight through the slit and just blew these bunkers apart. A Pukara aircraft took off from on the airfield and a guy uh, engaged it with a blowpipe and, and shot it down and it sort of crashed into, nearly at B Company actually, crashed into the, into the field. OC Patrol Company came walking up the hill. It was a bit like a, one of these World War II movies. The, the ground was exploding all around him and he was just staggering up the hill and you know, nothing touched him. You know, <laughs> and he came over the top of the gorse line. We dragged him down and um, he told us that um, one of his signalers had been killed, uh, lad I knew, and the other signaler had, had uh, been seriously injured. He'd left them on the forward slope and, and Chris assured him that we'd get to them and to go and see the doctor. And then the next morning, uh, Chris Keeble came to me and said, um, OK, we're, we're going to go in the village now. And he said, we're going to go and negotiate a, um, a ceasefire, you know, and, and their surrender. And he said, I want you to stay here. All right, and I promise you, no one's going to shoot at you today. And I think I was quite sarcastic, and I said, "Oh, that'd be really nice." And um, and off he went. We watched again from the gorse line. All these Argentinians come out, hundreds of them. we are like, "Who are these guys?" You know, it, hundreds and hundreds of Argentinians came out, and they all stood in like a big hollow square, and they had a bit of a sing, and then all threw the weapons down, and they went back into the village. And um, me and a couple of blokes said, "Right." Come on, we're off because we saw Chris Keeble walking into the village. Come on, we're going to go. We're going to go and make sure he's all right. So we we tabbed into the village, and it was um, it was surreal because there was there was probably only half a dozen of us in the settlement, and there was all these Argentinians just walking about past us to, because they'd been told to go to the sheep shearing pens to be prisoners of war. But you know they were just ignoring us, and we were like. It's all a bit odd. Um, the locals had been um, locked in a, um, the village hall and they'd been kept in there for a month or something, just out of you know, a couple of toilets and a sink. And the only person we allowed out was the, the sort of farm manager to go and get them food. So we, we went to the door, me and a couple of blokes, we opened the door and said, look, you can come out, you know, you're free. All power to two para's elbow. They won it with very little help from anybody else and, and good on them, well done. What my father did, by any standards, was pretty extraordinary. And um, uh, I think we should just, we should just celebrate courage. Um, and and leadership, and it, you know, the leadership he displayed was a was a certain type of inspirational leadership, and I hope he'll he'll be remembered uh, for that. <laughs>